the Jaguar seminar. Uh, today we have our very own Kunal Muli, from, uh, who, who got his PhD here at Caltech in 2015. He went to uh, Oxford uh, as a NC research fellow. Now he's back here at Caltech as a Jansky research fellow with a joint department between NRAO uh, and Caltech. His research focuses on nationalism and transient phenomena, especially when he talks about mergers. And he's leading the Jaguar program, not the new the Jaguar. <laughs> So thank you for that introduction, Alan, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so thanks to the exceptional efforts from um, people in the LIGO Virgo collaboration, in fact, we have some of them right here in this auditorium. We have now entered an era where we are routinely detecting gravitational wave sources. And out of the 20 or so events detected so far in the past four-ish years, uh, one event clearly stands out, and that is GW170817. And I would argue that that is because it was accompanied by electromagnetic radiation across, uh, across the spectrum. Uh, GW170817, together with its Ian counterpart, made an enormous impact in fields as wide-ranging as gravitational physics, jet and uh, cosmology, nucleosynthesis, equation of state of neutron-rich matter. And the journal Science named the discovery of the EM counterpart as the 2017 scientific breakthrough of the year. Um, and finally, the impact, of course, can be uh, seen in, in the 400 or so refereed publications that have uh, uh, resulted from this event over the past two years. So I'm thrilled to present uh, today about the EM counterparts of GW170817 and future GW events. And I'd like to acknowledge contributions from my collaborators and especially Greg Hallinan and Mansi Kaslival who are uh, professors here. Um, okay, just in case anyone in the room doesn't know what GW170817 is, just in case, just quickly go through the captions here, and that's the minimal introduction that is necessary for this event. Okay, so the outline of my talk is as follows. Uh, I will introduce the astrophysics of mergers and EM counterparts, then go on to talk about uh, GW170817 and what we learned from its EM counterpart, and then end with a discussion uh, of the astrophysics that we will learn from mergers detected in LIGO-Virgo runs O3 and beyond. And I will only focus on binary neutron star mergers and uh, neutron star black hole mergers. So let me give you a big picture first. Uh, mergers detected through gravitational waves are the end products of massive binary stellar evolution and serve as important probes of the evolutionary history of our universe. Uh, a typical elf star galaxy like our own produces a massy, massive binary system uh, with component masses larger than about five or eight solar masses once every few hundred years. Uh, now, if these two stars are close enough, they will undergo Roche lobe overflow, or there will be material transferred from the more massive star to the secondary star. And uh, <clears throat> uh, this, what this leaves behind is a helium core or a helium star, which will eventually, uh, and uh, this, this star will eventually end its life in a type 1 BC supernova explosion. Um, now, if, if the binary survives this explosion, as some of you may know, there are kicks imparted to the neutron stars or, or the remnants uh, during the supernova explosion. So it depends on whether the binary actually survives or not, this explosion. If it does, there will be a second stage of mass transfer during the high mass X-ray binary phase. Uh, and as the secondary star actually expands and starts uh, uh, dumping material into the, into the, uh, uh, onto its companion. So the system now eventually becomes dynamically unstable, and uh, this leads to the formation of a phase called the common envelope phase, where the secondary star is now expanded and completely engulfed uh, the, the remnant star, which is the neutron star in our case. Um, so if the binary now survives this phase, in fact, the common envelope phase is, is the least known, I would argue, of all the phases of binary stellar evolution. So if the binary survives this phase, then, uh, uh, then what it will give is there might be a final stage of mass transfer further, and then 
this this uh, this common envelope will give you a neutron star orbiting a helium star and uh, <clears throat> Further stripping of material will take place from the helium star, and finally, this will lead to a second supernova called an ultra stripped supernova. So, most binary systems are known to uh, theoretically survive this uh, supernova explosion. And uh, if the post supernova orbital period and the eccentricity, especially if it's large enough, then the binary will eventually merge in Hubble time, giving you high frequency gravitational wave radiation. So now what is special about binary neutron star mergers and neutron star black hole mergers as opposed to binary black hole mergers is that uh, tidal stripping of, uh, of these stars leaves behind a lot of neutron rich material and this can give rise to EM signals. Uh, this is just a simulation of two neutron stars merging and shows you the various, shows you firstly that the, this uh, tidal disruption occurs and shows you the various ejector components uh, that, that uh, give rise uh, uh, to the, these EM counterparts. So this is the same simulation shown as a series of frames now. Uh, it can be seen that uh, some of the tidally disrupted material forms an accretion disk or a torus. We can have accretion disk winds. Um, uh, we can have polar ejecta. Um, and uh, there is some material that is dynamically ejected at sub-relativistic speeds that is more isotropic than the rest of the components. Um, and in some simulations, we also see the magnetic fields orienting themselves in jet-like structures. <clears throat> so both thermal and non-thermal emission is, is expected from neutron star mergers. And Latimer and Schramm back in 1974 showed that, uh, or proposed that so a significant amount of material should be released in such mergers, in fact, uh, comparable to about a few percent of the solar mass. And this material undergoes our process nucleosynthesis, and as a result, uh, the heating of the material then gives rise to thermal signature called a kilonova or the macronova. So over the past couple of decades or so, there has been an evolution in the kilonova models uh, I think Lee and Pachinsky back in 1998 first proposed that uh, uh, we should have these R process heating and the kilonova signal should peak in the ultraviolet. Uh, there were more detailed calculations later on and full atomic data was eventually used. Um, and, and these works later found that, in fact, since a lot of heavy elements are formed, uh, the, the ejector should be very opaque, or the opacity should be very large, therefore the radiation should leak out in the near infrared instead of ultraviolet on time scales of about 10-ish days. Uh, on the other hand, now, if there is neutrino bombardment, the electron fraction of the ejector is going to go up, and such a scenario can be envisaged in a case where there's a long-lived magnetar, for example, as the remnant um, of, of the merger. And uh, this will give rise to lanthanide poor ejector uh, and a blue signal peaking uh, on timescales of a few hours will come through instead. And that's this part. So um, let me just quickly change the lighting a little bit because uh, it's a little hard to see. Okay, that's better. Okay, so in summary then, uh, lanthanide rich ejector gives you large opacity um, and a signal that will peak in the near infrared on time scales of 10-ish days. If the ejector is lanthanide poor, you'll have lower opacity, which means that the UV or blue signal can come through and that's where the kilonova will peak on time scales of less than about a day or so. Um, and then there are various ejector components that can give rise to non-thermal signatures, non-thermal emission. Firstly, there is the kilonova ejector, or the dynamical ejector that will propagate outwards and shock the interstellar medium, collide with the ISM, and the resulting shock will give rise to synchrotron radiation that uh, uh, is calculated to peak in, in the radio band here at radio frequencies, and uh, this will be on time scale of a few years or so. There were two influential papers around the year 1990 that suggested that neutron star mergers would give rise to uh, gamma ray signals or brief bursts of gamma rays observable on the Earth. And these gamma rays uh, could, produced, uh, could be produced through, let's say, interactions between neutrinos and antineutrinos. So the picture looks something like this. You have uh, the black hole remnant here of the merger, and then you have an accretion disk or torus. Um, the material 
uh, actually cools down through, uh, through neutrinos primarily, and then neutrino and antineutrino interactions can give rise to this uh, pair production. And this, uh, this outflow can be collimated through magnetic fields. Um, and what will happen is that uh, it, this, this, out, this flow will undergo relativist ex ex relativistic expansion until the point where uh, all the positron neutron neut sorry uh, electron positron pairs have uh, uh, annihilated irreversibly uh, uh, to the point where the outflow is now optically thin. So uh, this jetted outflow, if it points to the Earth it is going to give you a short burst of gamma rays on time scales of one to few seconds. Another means of producing uh, uh, gamma rays is via the blandford nyack mechanism where uh, you, if, if uh, the black hole is threaded by magnetic fields, then frame dragging is going to cause, uh, uh, cause the field lines to get twisted. And uh, this is able to efficiently uh, uh, efficiently extract electromagnetic energy from the rotation of the black hole. And there would be some internal dissipation mechanism within the jet by which this electromagnetic energy would be con converted to gamma rays. So these predicted uh, gamma ray bursts have been observed since the late 1960s. And uh, this is a very quick one slide introduction to these bursts called GRBs. So decades of gamma ray observations from space have shown that GRB signals uh, last between a fraction of a second and thousands of seconds. And the distribution of the time scales of these bursts is known to be bimodal. I'm not sure if you can see the time scales, but again, this is sub-second uh, going on to thousands of seconds or so. And uh, so the two distributions, the bimodal distribution is suggestive of two different populations, uh, conveniently called long bursts or long duration bursts and short bursts. So there is direct observational evidence that long GRBs come from stellar explosions called type 1b c supernovae and are preferentially located in star-forming galaxies. And uh, short GRBs, which are roughly uh, the bursts of duration two seconds or less, um, were thought to come from these uh, mergers of neutron stars which especially the evidence, there was indirect evidence because the dynamical time scales are of the order of milliseconds and so this is a reasonable or viable route by which you can produce short GRBs. So studies of a population of short GRBs has shown that the, L, the, the emission comes from a ultra relativistic jet that has opening angles of between 5 and 25 degrees. This is pointing towards the Earth, so you're seeing down the barrel essentially on axis jet. Uh, the Lorentz factor is about 100 or so, so highly relativistic expansion. And uh, in the fireball model, which, is, uh, which has been widely used to explain the, the emission from, from, from uh, these GRBs, uh, you have some internal dissipation mechanism through which produces gamma rays, firstly prompt gamma rays. Uh, and then once the flow goes and collides with the ambient medium, you get late time afterglow or non-thermal radiation uh, uh, that, that uh, basically comes through in optical x-rays and, and radio frequencies on time scales of a few days. So really the multi-messenger approach of using gravitational waves together with uh, the electromagnetic uh, radiation to probe mergers is a very powerful means to study astrophysics, fundamental physics, and cosmology. And so gravitational waves by themselves give constraints on the masses, spins, binary inclination, and distance, and uh, the e neutron star equation of state, and perhaps also the nature of the remnant produced through the ring down signal. And together with the EM counterparts, we get access to the rich astrophysics of these mergers, the mass, the composition, the morphology of the ejecta, uh, and the environments of these mergers. So precise localization and geometry derived from the EM signal breaks the degeneracy between the luminosity, distance, and inclination. And we are able to measure very precisely the rate of expansion of the universe or the Hubble's constant. And better constraints on the neutron star equation of state are possible by studying the properties of, uh, of the ejecta here after the merger, and, and so much more. 
So the excellent opportunity to harness this uh, multi-messenger approach came with the discovery of GW170817. So going to, on to the section two of my talk, um, so just a quick uh, reminder of what, uh, what this event was, uh, was that many of you would know that the GW localization on the sky was about 30 square degrees. The event was, was somewhere between 32 and 48 megaparsecs. The total binary mass was about 2.7 solar masses. And the inclination of the binary was uh, less than 28 degrees uh, from the gravitational wave signal. So it was more face-on than edge-on. And uh, the, most ex uh, the more exciting bit for e e EM observers was that there was a coincident gamma ray signal. So the signal was delayed slightly, about 1.7 seconds after the GW signal. It was uh, discovered by Fermi and integral satellites. And it was the duration of this burst suggested about two seconds was uh, suggestive of short GRBs, but it was highly unusual pulse, nothing similar to what we had seen in the past, because it had uh, the, the photons in the peak of this pulse were extremely high energy, and there was a tail of soft emission or low energy photons in a white, uh, white tail, so called tail. Um, and if you compared the energy with other short GRBs, it was about 10,000 times less bright. So, um, so it was complete outlier in terms of what we knew of sh regular short uh, GRBs at that time. <clears throat> okay, so um, really then the question arose whether this is really a typical short GRB or whether this is something completely else, uh, completely different. Um, and so the EM observers went and uh, used every single telescope they could to point at this location of the sky, trying to find uh, other EM signatures. And uh, this was, it was first found in the optical about 12 hours after the event, this highly unusual transient um, that, was, uh, that was localized to this NGC 4993 galaxy. It was at the right distance and at the right part of the sky. And soon it was found uh, that this was very likely the counterpart of, of the gravitational wave event. And if one did a comparison with, sh with between NGC 4993 and the hosts of other short GRBs, one found that it was somewhat of an outlier in terms of the star formation, the uh, age of the stars in this galaxy, the luminosity, etc. So it is nothing typical of what we knew of short GRBs. Okay, so uh, the EM counterpart was monitored ex extensively with telescopes on the ground and in space, and I can see several faces in the room who contributed extensively to what we know about the EM counterpart of GW170817. And here's a quick overview of the thermal and non-thermal radiation from this event. Uh, the thermal kilonova lasted for uh, only a few weeks. The blue, uh, the, the blue part, the blue component of this, uh, of this kilonova decayed extremely rapidly on a time scale of a few days, in fact. And uh, there was this redder emission, near-infrared emission, that lasted a little longer. And the kilonova probed the mass. So the kilonova probed the mass, the composition, um, and the velocity of the Newtonian ejector. And then there was the non-thermal radiation that was first detected in um, in x-rays about nine days after the merger and in radio 16 days after the merger and uh, Greg Hallinan and myself and, the, uh, and Alessandra Corsi from Texas Tech University played a major role in, in the discovery of the radio counterpart. Um, and this uh, non-thermal afterglow signal uh, was essentially a single power law across the electromagnetic spectrum and it was monitored extensively at radio wavelengths. The afterglow itself probed the energy and morphology of uh, the relativistic ejecta and the density of the surrounding environment. So this is some fantastic data, spectral data of the kilonova that was taken by the X-Shooter telescope on the VLT telescope. And it spans right from about near UV to near infrared. So, uh, and then this is showing you how the spectrum evolved as a function of time. This is about 1.5 days after the merger, and this is 7.5 days after the merger. What I've just overlaid to guide your eye on this is dashed lines is black body curves. And you can immediately see that this is uh, so surprisingly similar to a black body emission. 
and maybe the students in the room will appreciate that if something looks like a black body, then we should have uh, the, the, the opacity is actually uh, quite large, and this is exactly what we found. Another really fascinating thing, what you can just read off from this uh, plot is, uh, in fact, these broad absorption features tell you what the speed of the ejector is. So let's take uh, this one micron, for example, at 2.5 days, it shows a absorption feature with a full width half max of roughly 0.2 microns. And what that implies is that the ejector is traveling at about 20% the speed of light. So some really fun things you can do just looking at the data by eye. And if you do a more detailed calculations using models and so, at about two days after the merger, there were some uh, probable detections of uh, cesium and tellurium absorption features that were reported um, in the optical spectrum. And a little later, about five days after the merger, uh, there were uh, absorption features such as neodymium that were uh, reported. So these are, again, possibilities that uh, uh, seem exciting but need to be confirmed. <clears throat> and then Mansi actually uh, did a fantastic job collecting data from the growth collaboration, so this is a worldwide network of telescopes, and what she found is that the total optical luminosity really faded very quickly or went down very quickly. And the black body curves that I showed you in the previous slide, you can convert them to an effective temperature, right? So uh, this is photometric data now that you can use to uh, really pin down the temperature as a function of time, and that is decaying rapidly as well. And now, I'm sure most of you have heard of the, the spherical cow expansion. And we can, we can use this uh, sort of simplification that whatever the morphology of the ejecta, we just assume a spherical outflow and uh, convert the luminosity and temperature uh, to a length scale. And so uh, this is shown in this plot, and then you can convert that to a speed. So it seems that early times uh, show high velocity, and then at later times there's about... Uh, about uh, decreases to about 10% the speed of light. So really the luminosity, if you try to fit these kilonova models, no single model really fits the data. The models are shown in dashed, uh, dashed lines. And what this means is that we need two components to explain the data. There needs to be a faster blue component that peaks at earlier times and slower red component. And this is again uh, consistent with what the theory predicted uh, several years ago, right? Um, so this faster component is traveling about uh, 20 to 30 percent the speed of light um, and has a mass of roughly 1 percent the solar mass, and it's lanthanide poor. And then there is this fast, slower red component, which is traveling at 10 percent the speed of light, has a mass of about 1 percent the solar mass, and uh, is lanthanide rich. So this is, again, a good confirmation of what we expected. Again, there were some details that were surprises, but broadly it is consistent with what theorists really predicted. So a plausible explanation of what is going on with these blue and red components, just showing you visually, is uh, in this scenario we need a short-lived hypermassive neutron star to explain these two components. And so this is the, sh the, the intermediate remnant, and then you have accretion disk around it. And what this neutron star gives is it provides neutrinos, preferentially uh, bombarding the polar ejecta here and increasing the electron fraction, which results in lanthanide poor ejecta. Um, and uh, that's why the blue light can escape through at early times. And the accretion disk is shielding this neutrino bombardment, and so the equatorial ejecta can remain electron poor and gives rise to lanthanide rich ejecta, that, uh, and, and therefore we see only the red signal speaking at later times from this ejecta. So, so that, that's basically what uh, the, the consistent picture so far is, as I've seen. I mean, there are alternative explanations, but this is the sort of uh, consensus so far. And again, this mass of the ejecta, which was a few percent of the solar mass, was consistent with the predictions made back in 1974 by Latimer and Schramm. Okay, so if we quickly then go to the periodic table of what is going on, then uh, uh, we see that it's, it is somewhat of a consistent picture, is that at early times you see this blue kilonova, which has to be lanthanide poor, 
and you see cesium and tellurium features in the, in the ejecta. So these are not lanthanides, and that's consistent. And at later times, you have this red, red kilonova that has to be lanthanide rich, and you see neodymium features in the, in the spectrum. Uh, again, possible features of neodymium, but it's again a self-consistent picture there. Okay, so Mansi actually pointed the Spitzer telescope, um, and between 30 and 80 days after the merger, she saw a rapidly declining emission at 4.5 micrometer wavelength. And uh, what this uh, possibly suggests, and she tells me this, uh, that uh, this may be indicative that there is a high abundance of heavy nuclei, specifically those which have a half-life between two and four weeks in the ejecta. So going back to the periodic table, then Mansi's observation uh, may imply the presence of uh, species like osmium, uh, radium, and europium in the ejecta. So these highlighted in black. Okay, so this is a very simple cartoonish picture of what we know of the kilonova, is that there is a fairly isotropic uh, uh, sort of a material that is ejected at speeds of around 20% the speed of light. But really, the prompt gamma ray signal that we saw implied a much faster outflow. So what, uh, what I've shown here is that if you see the, if you calculate the optical depth due to pair production uh, for the gamma rays, it's, it's given by this formula. The numerator is simply the number of photons that were seen in the pulse, and the denominator is just the surface area of the shell that is emitting uh, these gamma rays. And sigma t is the, the scattering cross-section, of course. Um, and so if you say that the, uh, the ejecta is Newtonian, which means that gamma is approximately 1, then you get a huge optical depth, which means that you shouldn't see the, the radiation should all thermalize, and you shouldn't see any non-thermal radiation. But we, of course, saw uh, non-thermal gamma rays from this event. So if you plug in gamma of about 3 in this equation, then we can bring down the optical depth to about 1. So now we can start seeing uh, the, the gamma ray photons, really. So the Lorentz factor has to be at least about 2 or 3 in order to explain the gamma ray emission. Um, so about traveling about 95% the speed of light. And this would naturally be explained if we had a jet in the system similar to short GRBs do. Um, and then these are the viewing angle constraints with, with respect to the Earth that uh, we received from, from LIGO and Virgo, GW signal. Okay, so we collected some really valuable radio data over the first 100 days after the merger, and these data did not show any obvious jet signature in there. So what we saw was, was the slowly rising radio emission, and we could immediately rule out a short GRB-like event where the, the jet is directly pointing towards the Earth, because in this case, you would have a declining afterglow rather than a rising light curve right here. And we could also rule out an, a simple off-axis jet, because uh, where the, the jet is actually pointed at a certain angle with respect to the observer, and uh, in this case, you would expect a steep rise followed by a peak and a shallow decline. So just think of uh, relativistic beaming here. What is going on is uh, that when, when a photon emitting source is traveling at some angle with respect uh, to an observer, it, it only emits in one uh, over, over a cone, which has an opening angle of 1 over gamma. And once the flow decelerates and uh, the, the, uh, the Lorentz factor decreases, to 1 over theta, where theta is the uh, angle between, let's say, the outflow and you, the observers, only in that case you are going to see the photons from this, uh, from this uh, relativistic source. And so uh, this is what the sharp rise actually means, is that uh, you're seeing only photons later on when it has decelerated. Um, and really, what we could nail down is only a single kind of an outflow, which is a wide-angle outflow. Um, and this was completely new. Uh, we hadn't seen in any of the GRBs so far this kind of an afterglow, this slowly rise, rising afterglow. And it implied that uh, this, this outflow that we were seeing, relativistic outflow, had to have significant radial or angular structure. Um, and uh, this was fairly intriguing and exciting for all of us because it was something completely new. Okay, but... Uh, Really, 
this again could be explained if there is a jet and if the jet is interacting with this neutron rich material then it's going to give rise to this uh, this uh, bubble like structure that i've shown in red here and so this ultra is consistent with the presence of the jet but just that the jet, fate of the jet if it exists uh, is unknown because uh, it would it would be either a successful jet where it where the jet penetrates this neutron rich material or it gets completely choked by it uh, and in this cartoon image of course uh, the merger ejecta is in blue the jet is in yellow and then this interaction also called uh, uh, also called a cocoon is shown in red so uh, this the the even 200 days after the merger took place there is no consensus in the community as to which of these scenarios is the right scenario um and uh, you can see that this large body of publications that are trying to deal with this issue but reaching no consensus and this was also very hotly debated in conferences worldwide uh but really the controversy was finally resolved through a uh, very long baseline interferometric observations that uh, we carried out uh, about uh, Uh, several weeks after the gravitational wave event took place and this vlbi technique actually uh, really relies on collecting data from a wide range of radio telescopes and here we combine data from the very very long baseline array the vla in new mexico and gbt in west virginia so this is really something like a giant continent wide telescope uh, that uh, is giving us an extremely high resolution snapshot of the merger ejecta of of the radio source itself and uh, what we were trying to see is what is really the morphology of the ejecta and is it consistent with one picture or the other and what we found with vlbi was something quite spectacular the region emitting radio waves actually moved on the sky about a millionth of a degree or 3 milliarc seconds over a span of 155 days and that implied that the source was moving faster than the speed of light in fact the apparent speed was something like four times uh, the speed of light and this superluminal motion was really the smoking gun of the presence of a successful jet so the jet had in fact uh, penetrated successfully from the neutron rich material and that is what we were the motion of this jet is what we were detecting in uh, in radio waves so although at early times the afterglow emission was dominated by the cocoon at later times now it was dominated by the jet um and that's uh, essentially what i had explained earlier that the relativistic jet had to decelerate in order to uh, emit in our line of sight and by confirming the presence of the jet we had finally strong observational evidence that uh, neutron star mergers were in fact related with uh, these phenomena called short grbs Okay so superluminal motion is really just an optical illusion caused by uh, a, a a source that is traveling close to the speed of light at a certain angle with respect to the observer and the apparent speed that you measure from such a source is related with the actual speed beta and the viewing angle in with with this equation and you if you plot it up for various uh, uh, real speeds of the ejecta then you get curves looking something like this and remember that our uh, vlbi constraint was somewhere here the constraint on the viewing angle now that we received from ligo and virgo from the gravitational wave signal now this is assuming a, that the planck's value of h not is correct was uh, that theta v should be less than 28 degrees so this was the available parameter space and what we could work out with vlbi is that uh, uh, we could get very precise constraint on on the viewing angle that way um okay so um really what what happened so this is a nice simulation of what we think happened of the aftermath uh, aftermath of uh, gw170817 and uh, this is uh, done by uh, really nice work done by or gotlieb who is a phd student with udi nakar at tel aviv university so you can see the merger ejector right here the jet is propagating in this direction and uh, uh you see that the jet has in fact successfully penetrated through this ejecta and is carrying some of the neutron rich matter along with it and this 
uh, wide structure is what we are seeing at initial times and at later times we start seeing the jet. And the motion of the jet is what we are detecting with the VLBI. <coughs> Okay, so here's a quick summary of the EM counterparts that we saw. Uh, there were two components, lanthanide rich. Uh, lanthanide rich was likely equatorial or isotropic. There are a few percent of solar mass traveling at about 10% the speed of light. There was lanthanide free ejecta that was likely polar and about 1% the solar mass traveling at somewhere between 20 and 30% the speed of light. And the kilonova really gave us some first clues into what kind of R process nuclei were produced in, after the merger. And then the afterglow gave us uh, an insight. In fact, it was a confirmation that this event did launch a successful relativistic jet. And for the first time, we were really seeing the angular structure of the jet because we had seen this event uh, away from the axis of the jet. And we obtained very precise constraints on the geometry. In fact, the viewing angle was somewhere between 15 and 25 degrees. Uh, the opening of the angle of the jet had to be less than 5 degrees, so extremely narrow, and we were able to get constraints on the density of the surrounding medium and the energy in, within the jet. <clears throat> and what we find is that these parameters are generally consistent with the broad picture of what we have short GRBs. Okay, and it, uh, so while we are here right now on the time axis, somewhere here, the afterglow has almost faded to a point where we cannot see it anymore. And it still remains to be seen whether this uh, kilonova ejecta actually goes and collides with the ambient medium and whether it will give rise to this late time afterglow. And that will be exciting. Second component that we'll see a rebrightening of uh, at later times, perhaps. Okay, so using our tight constraints on the geometry, we were also able to get uh, a precise measurement of the Hubble's constant through the stand standard siren technique. And you can see the improvement of uh, using the VLBI measurement here is that the precision actually is so much more improved. And these are showing the posterior distributions of uh, GW only measurement versus when we add the VLBI measurement also um, to find the inclination angle and therefore uh, calculate H0. Uh, and this inset is showing you that uh, over the next few years, as we start seeing more events, we'll be able to decrease this uncertainty in the H0 to such an extent that if we have, let's say, 15-ish events, GW170817 like, we will be able to have enough precision to solve the discrepancy between the, the Planck value of H0 and the type 1A supernova measurement of H0. Okay, so... Uh, Really looking forward, GW170017 was a unique event, but um, it represents only a very initial exploration of a very rich uh, scientific uh, uh, landscape. And uh, a wide range of parameters such as the total mass of the binary, the mass ratio, the kind of remnant produced, and parameters like the geometry, inclination, and environment are going to govern the variety of EM counterparts that we will see. Uh, for gravitational wave events. And uh, in binary neutron star mergers, we generally expect to see the blue and red components of the kilonova, whereas uh, in neutron star black hole systems, we, we don't have any neutrino source there, uh, this uh, short-lived hypermassive neutron star. It directly is a black hole, so we may not uh, see the blue kilonova. In fact, there would only be the red kilonova there. Um, the absence of squeezed polar ejecta means that the jet won't have anything to interact with and will escape freely, uh, therefore leading to cocoon-free emission. And then finally, in the, sh in the small fraction of events where uh, the orientation and distance are favorable and relativistic outflows are, uh, are produced, we will see coincident gamma rays with gravitational wave sources. Okay, so very quickly then, in the next uh, maybe 10 minutes or so, I'd like to um, cover this last section um, of what, we, what astrophysics will we learn from these uh, EM counterparts in the future uh, or, or in the coming decade or so. And this in no way is a complete list. Through better understanding of the kilonova, we will uh, be able to get some understanding of how the enrichment of R process elements takes place in the universe. And together with gravitational wave signal, 
uh, we will be able to obtain strong constraints on the neutron star equation of state. From the afterglow, we will understand the jet launching and propagation and how gamma rays are produced. So this is still a, an, a, a bit of an unknown, actually, uh, surprisingly. Um, and we can also use these mergers, mergers as fossil records for binary stellar evolution and uh, try to understand the bits and pieces that we still haven't figured out in, in this uh, aspect of uh, stellar evolution. And also, maybe last but not least, try to understand about the magnetospheres of these neutron stars in if there is any prompt radio emission detected from, from the collision between these magnetospheres. So I'm just uh, going to go in a little more detail about a few of these. And firstly, talking about the jet physics. In the case of GW170817, we were able to probe the angular structure of the jet cocoon system um, because the event was observed away from the axis of the jet. And so this has really not been possible with any of the gamma ray bursts so far because the emission is so much more dominated by the core of the jet because we're seeing it directly down the barrel. However, most of the gravitational wave events that we will see will be off axis, away from the axis of, uh, the, of the jet, and that presents us with a good opportunity to probe what, what lies uh, around the jet. So these angular structures is what we can probe, similar to GW170817. And many intrinsic parameters, such as the delay time between the merger and the jet launch, and the duration of the jet launch itself, the jet opening angle and energy, and the structure and energy of the ejector cloud is what is imprinted in the angular structure of the uh, relativistic outflow. Um, so this recent study found uh, differences in the angular structure as a function of the jet launch delay time. And what is seen is that more energy is dumped into the cocoon or at wider angles for longer delay times and making the angular structure broad. Uh, another study tried to uh, see which parameters actually affected the fate of the jet. So for a certain range of ejecta and jet energies and jet opening angles, the, the jet was seen to be choked by this neutron-rich material, whereas in other cases it succeeded. <clears throat> and finally, the energy, energetics and jet parameters together will give us key insights into the jet launching mechanism, whether it is blind first NIAC or a neutrino anti neutrino uh, sort of uh, interaction, what is the baryon loading, etc. So, this is a very nice visual of what uh, I just tried to explain. In this simulation, we have a jet that is launched within this merger ejector. The jet is, is being launched in this direction. And uh, uh, so, in this case, the jet is completely choked, but then you can clearly see this angular structure that it is developing. Uh, over a time of scale of uh, um, several seconds, in fact. Um, and then <clears throat> really we can play it again. Um, really, the parameters of this, of this jet, the, for example, this jet is launched for a duration of one second, and the delay time between the merger and the jet launch itself is about a second again. So these angular structures really encode the initial jet parameters and the ejecta structure that... Uh, uh, that exist at the time of the merger. And one of my students, Fee McCartini, is trying to explore which angular structures may be consistent with uh, the afterglow light curve. So we've done a meticulous uh, reprocessing of all the afterglow data that has been collected from, from all telescopes in the radio, optical, and x-rays. And we are starting to find these fine details that have been missed in the past that reveal uh, the kinks in the light curve, uh, if you will, um, that give clues into what might be the real angular structure of, uh, of this uh, relativistic ejector. And so all previous studies have uh, really used angular structures obtained either from hydrodynamical simulations, which unfortunately have many free parameters, uh, or they have used simple parametric forms like Gaussian power law, etc. Um, so while the overall trend of the light, light curve, the smooth rise and the sharp decline are captured by these models or by these uh, profiles, the finer details are missed. And uh, with these exquisite data, Tapir Postdoc, Wenbin Liu and I are trying to explore if uh, uh, the shape of the light curve can be directly translated into an angular profile 
with analytical techniques. Okay, uh, another interesting area where EM counterparts will play a crucial role is stellar evolution. And this is a simplified version of the evolutionary sequence that I presented uh, during the introduction. You start with the massive binary, the massive star goes supernova, the secondary star expands and there is common evolution phase, uh, evolution phase, and uh, then the secondary star goes supernova. And finally we have uh, uh, this, this uh, birth of this compact binary system that will take anywhere between several millions of years to billions of years until the merger, and this is something called the delay time there. So if we can understand this delay time, then we can work out our way backwards and try to understand what were the parameters at the time of this birth of the, the co coalescing of this compact binary system. Um, so a little bit of reverse engineering parameters like what were the masses, what were the initial separations, and what was the eccentricity of this, of this uh, binary system at birth. Um, and this will really give us insights into the poorly understood common evolution, uh, common envelope phase of uh, stellar evolution. And the location of the merger within the host galaxy together with these delay times will give us some insights into uh, what kind of kick velocities or kicks are imparted to the, uh, to the neutron stars at the time of supernova uh, because of these asymmetries in these explosions. It may also be possible to pinpoint the birth sites of these uh, compact binary systems within the host galaxy if we know all these parameters. Uh, and finally, we can try to make all these inferences meet with evolutionary models and try to make them agree and ultimately understand about the progenitor binary system and, of course, about stellar evolution itself. And for doing all of this, uh, an understanding of the merger delay time is, is very important. So there may be substantial uncertainties in the delay times that are calculated for individual mergers, but if you take a distribution for a sample of mergers, then you'll be able to beat the uncertainty down uh, quite significantly. And hence there have, been, uh, there have been several efforts, ongoing efforts, to try and understand this delay time distribution for the sample of uh, merger. So just to show you mathematically what it means is that uh, the merger delay time is related to the initial separation of the compact binary system A uh, and the eccentricity of the system uh, with this equation. And if you start with a power law distribution in initial separations, then you get a power law in the delay times that looks something like this. <clears throat> um, now, the initial orbital separation of the massive binary stars approximately follows a uh, one over a kind of a relationship. And if this uh, sort of uh, distribution is preserved in the compact binary system, then you'll have delay times going as something like one over t, the distribution. Uh, but really the com common envelope phase uh, modifies this quite significantly because it reduces the separation by one or two orders of magnitude. And uh, what this results in is uh, this one over A cube kind of relationship. Uh, and this would give uh, a t to the minus three halves uh, distribution in um, time delay. Okay, so this, uh, just going quickly to the case of GW170817, um, this is, this is a nice Hubble picture of, uh, of this event, and this is showing you the optical transient, uh, the kilonova within this uh, galaxy. So a detailed analysis of this host galaxy suggests that the median stellar population age is about 11 giga years. And if we assume that this is a reasonable, um, uh, reasonable approximation to when the binary actually formed, the, the compact binary formed, then it means that it took about 11 giga years, 11 billion years for this uh, system to merge. So using that as a proxy for delay time, we can calculate the initial separation to be uh, of this compact binary to be about 4.5 solar radii. And this might mean that, uh, mean something substantial about the common envelope phase of how the reduction in the initial separation for the binary, binary components of the binary actually took place. Uh, but of course, this has very large error bars and which propagates into large 
error bar for, for the initial separation. So, so again, with single event, there is some very limited uh, things that one can do, but with the delay time distribution, one can really start doing uh, some real uh, um, science with this. And then together with the location of the host, uh, location of the transient within the host, and the time delay of 11 giga years, we can place conservative upper limits to the supernova kick velocities of about 200 kilometers per second. Okay, a third and final uh, sort of interesting area that I want to delve into is uh, the enrichment of R process elements in the universe. And the two most important uh, astrophysical events that yield R process elements are neutron star mergers and rare classes of supernovae. And the rare supernovae really enrich the galaxies according to the star formation history. And we know that the star formation peaked at around a redshift of two or about 10 billion years ago. And so, uh, whereas supernovae would enrich the universe this way, there would be a certain delay to the enrichment of neutron star mergers because of this delay time distribution. And so, an improved understanding of uh, the R process uh, abundances that uh, you get from kilonovae and observations of future kilonovae will tell us that, together with precise uh, constraints on the delay time distribution as well as uh, uh, the precise rates of these mergers will give us, uh, will really help us piece together the puzzle of uh, how heavy element enrichment took place uh, through cosmic history. So I'll just leave you with these takeaway points. I've covered a lot of information, but uh, if you can take away these points, then uh, that'll, that'll be uh, most of what, what you need to remember after this talk. So I'll take questions after that. Thank you.